You know, when it comes to classic cars and hot rods, there is no shortage of information. Anything you want to know about engines, transmissions, rear ends, carburetors, cams, heads, headers, exhaust systems, it's all out there in abundance. But you know what's lacking? Basic understanding of the classic car, the traditional air conditioning system, AC system, as, as installed by the manufacturers on these cars. It's a mystery to a lot of people. And I think this video might be helpful to those who you don't want to replace, you don't want to just gut the thing and, and install an aftermarket AC system. You want to try to keep the parts original and work with what's there. Now it's the middle of July and this is not the time to be doing an overhaul on your car's AC system, but that's how we roll around here. And I decided I'm going to go through the one on the swinger because it needs help from one end to the other. It needs a lot of help. So I'm going to give you guys a tour through the AC system of this car. I'll explain what it needs, why it needs it, and I'm going to try to make this as generic as possible so that it fits General Motors, Ford, AMC, whatever you happen to be working with. Because these systems are all generally universal through that era, through let's say late 50s, through the early 80s and middle 80s. Actually, really, they haven't changed all that much to today. But let's just focus on this type of system. And like I said, I'll go through the differences. Now, I'm not going to cover evacuating. I'm not going to cover charging. I'm not going to cover any of the specific things that would apply to a, a particular make or model. You would have to do that on your own because they're all a little bit different. How much they're charged, the, the, the service procedures, they were all a little bit different. But I want to cover the basics and the universals. And we'll use this one as an example. So, you can't really start a journey through the AC system without the compressor. The compressor is where it all begins. It's not where the actual refrigeration takes place, but the compressor is the heart of the system. So to turn on the compressor, there's always an, an electronic signal, something that's given from the dash, from the control unit. And on different cars, it's all done in different ways. But either way, no matter how you slice it, it's a 12 volt signal that's gonna hit the clutch on the compressor and signal it to turn on because the, the this section of it is there's two different sections you've got the pulley and then you've got the actual compressor and in between here is an electronic clutch so when 12 volts is applied to it it engages and the outer part turns the center and that's what gets the compressor going now these Chryslers of this era all used this V2 style compressor Fords used a combination of a piston type compressor, that's single, the, the single cylinder stand-up one that was also used on a lot of the aftermarket or dealer installed AC units of the time, and General Motors used rotary style compressors. But they all did the same basic thing. Their purpose is to compress the refrigerant and send it through the system. And they all use an electronic clutch to get them started. So the system depends on a 12 volt signal from the heater controls. Before the 12 volt system gets to the compressor, it goes through a pressure switch. And that's right here on this car. And it's mounted on the dryer bottle. And we'll, we'll talk about the dryer bottle in a minute. But this right here is the switch, the pressure switch, that allows the signal to go to the compressor. Now why do they put a pressure switch here? It's to protect the internals of the compressor because it's lubricated by the refrigerant and the oil that's in the system. So if the level drops, there isn't enough lubrication inside the compressor and it will seize or it'll, it'll score itself up and the, and the efficiency drops. So before the signal can get to the compressor to tell the clutch to turn on, it has to go through the pressure switch. Now one of the ways you can test ahead of time to see if the compressor is any good or not, if it's, if it's locked up or if there's any real issues with it, is to pull the leads off of here, have the switch on inside the car, and then just jump this out. You jump these out and it should the compressor should turn on. If you jump these out, if you've got 12 volts here and you jump these out, but the compressor doesn't turn on, it means that the clutch itself is bad. All right, so let's leave that for next. Now, one preliminary check you can do on any AC compressor is to make sure that it's not seized. Or in this case, it's completely dead. It's the opposite of seized. Let's just grab the center part and give it a turn. So normally, you'll feel some resistance here. And when you feel resistance here, 
it, it means that the compressor is sealing internally and it's going to do its job. This one here has absolutely no resistance whatsoever, which means that internally the compressor is just worn out. It's shot. And obviously, if you go to go like this in the center part and it doesn't move at all, it means the compressor is seized. Okay, enough of that. I think we got the compressor part of it down. So the system is filled with a refrigerant, usually Freon. And there's different types of the R12 that these cars are born with, and 134, and all different hybrid things. I'm not going to get into that. But the idea behind any refrigerant is that it has very small molecules and they move very fast. And the change from being compressed to being freed is what allows that temperature drop that you feel inside the car. So that coolant, the refrigerant, I say coolant, the refrigerant is in the closed system. Its first stop is the compressor, and the compressor, by virtue of the fact that it's compressing that liquid, is raising its temperature. Anytime you compress something, you raise its temperature. And so the first stop that the Freon, or the, the refrigerant, goes to after it leaves the compressor is the condenser. And that's this piece at the front of the car. This is always mounted in front of the radiator. It's got to be clear, you know, you can't be clogged with leaves and debris and stuff like that. It's got to be clear. The refrigerant is forced through the line, and this is the high side. Now, there's another thing, too. You've got a high side and a low side. The high side is where all your high pressure takes place. The low side is the return to the compressor. So, just so you understand those terms, say high side and low side. And you charge through the low side, not the high side. All right, we'll, we'll cover that in a, in a minute. So the refrigerant is forced through the lines through the condenser. The condenser cools it. Only purpose of the condenser is to cool the compressed refrigerant. Now from the condenser, it goes to a dryer bottle. Now this is going to be configured differently on different cars. On some cars, it's just an, what they call an accumulator, like GM cars. On the Chryslers, and Fords, certain Fords, this is called a dryer bottle, a receiver dryer. So the Freon goes through the condenser, it's cooled now, it goes to the receiver dryer. So this is, this serves a couple of purposes. First, it's a reservoir for refrigerant and oil, or the, the mixture of refrigerant and oil. And there's also a decadent in here, and what that does is it sucks any moisture that finds its way into the system out, or it traps it, I should say. And that's the function of this. Now, the dryer bottle is a disposable part. This is a throwaway part. Anytime the system is opened, you're supposed to just take this and toss it. Because as soon as it's opened, the moisture from the air gets in there and it saturates the element inside of it. And it won't function anymore the way it's supposed to. Yes, in a pinch, I've often reused these things just because, well, I want to get this thing running and, you know, we'll get it down the road, but you're not supposed to. So anytime you open the system, anytime you service the system, replace this bottle. These things are cheap. This is only like $8 off a of Rock Auto right now. Like the cheap one is $8, the expensive one is like $17. But again, it's a throwaway part. Now also there's a sight glass built into these. So here's a sight glass. And the sight glass is so that when this system is, is, is correctly charged, you won't see any bubbles or foam. You'll just see the, the refrigerant running through in its liquid form. If you see bubbles, you've got an issue. Several different issues it could be. Google that. Bubbles in your, in your refrigerant sight glass. So now we've got the compressed refrigerant has been cooled. And it's sent along this line, and it comes to what's called an expansion valve. Now, this is where the AC takes place. And this is where two different, the two different types of systems are going to have different ways. So, generally speaking, General Motors cars, the cars with radial compressors of the era, use an orifice tube. And the orifice tube is going to be found... So, on this car, you see you've got the dryer bottle up here. On General Motors cars, you've got it mounted back here. It's called an accumulator. They mount it back here and the orifice tube is mounted in there. Now the purpose of the orifice tube is to be the expansion point for the refrigerant. So it goes into the orifice tube small and it comes out the orifice tube big. And that expansion from small to big is what causes the temperature drop. 
on these cars these use this expansion valve and the expansion valve serves the same purpose but it's metered and it's metered with these temperature sensitive pots so one of aside from just allowing the the refrigerant to expand and cool so you see here's a small line going in and here's a big line going out okay small in big out and then in between here is the valve itself but the valve is regulated through these lines right here and the reason for that is because if it gets too cold it'll freeze up the evaporator underneath the dash and we're going to get to the evaporator in a second so that's the purpose of this general motors cars or cars that use a uh, an orifice tube they have a valve that's triggered electronically in the compressor so this is where the actual temperature change takes place common on these and, and especially this one here is when they go bad they'll stick and that's what this one was doing before the compressor finally like turned its last you know pressurized revolution I would occasionally have to come out and tap this to get it to function so I know this is bad all right so now we go inside the car and the clo I mean honestly the closest thing you can come to hell without actually being dead is under the dashboard of an air-conditioned classic car things are just crammed in there it's a miserable dark horrible place with a lot of stuff but the key elements that you're going to find under the dash and it's common to all cars all of these cars all AC systems is you're going to find the evaporator and you're going to find the blend door so the evaporator is where this now expanded refrigerant goes through it looks just like a radiator it's, it's like a small version of the condenser the hot air passing through the car passes through it cools it off that's the AC that you feel there's also a blend door so the blend door is what regulates between the hot side of the HVAC system and the cold side of the HVAC system depending on which side it's on you're gonna get hot air or cold air or a mixture of the two to regulate the temperature on these cars there's also a heater control valve this is this isn't on all cars but these cars have them so this is just a vacuum operated valve that when the AC is on closes off the hot water flow into the car so it's gone through the evaporator and the hot air inside the car has been forced through it by the blower motor it comes out cold but now the refrigerant has to return to the compressor and that's where this big line comes from so the small the smaller large line going in goes to the evaporator and then the biggest line of all is the one that comes from the evaporator and returns the gaseous freon to the compressor and then from there the compressor goes about compressing it and turning it back into that liquid form that runs through the condenser and that is the cycle and that is like universal I mean, everything I just showed you here is basically universal to all of these cars all of these systems it's a complicated system in that there are a lot of parts but it's a simple system in its basic function and if you've got the service manual or you can locate the service manual the literature for your car your particular car and it'll go through all of these these different systems at least now you have an idea how it works and if you know how it works you can go about troubleshooting and repairing it yourself now as far as charging goes yes you can just run down to the auto parts store buy a couple of cans of refrigerant and pump it in and odds are it'll work but it's not going to work very efficiently first you also need to have the right oil the oil that you put in the AC system has to be compatible with the freon or the refrigerant that you're using so there's some research you need to do on that end too if you score a bunch of old cans R12 it needs a certain type of oil if you're using a later model or a later style like the, the R134 that uses its own oil you can just throw a couple of cans in and it'll work but it's not going to work very well and if you've got a lot of moisture in the system because there's always going to be some moisture if there's air in it there's going to be some moisture in the system it can prematurely deteriorate the compressor and the expansion valve so my recommendation is have it charged by saying you know, go for a couple extra dollars and have the system properly evacuated 
and charged by someone who's got the knowledge and has got the equipment. You can do it yourself. But again, see, we're evacuating. What evacuating is, is taking all of the air out. You, you put the system under a vacuum and you suck all of the air out of it. And as you suck all the air out of it, you can actually watch on the outlet side of, of that suction, you can actually watch vapor come out. And that's, that's the moisture that's just trapped in, in the air that was in the system. So like I said, my recommendation as far as charging goes is you're probably better off dropping a couple of bucks and let somebody do it the right way. All right, I think I covered everything I wanted to on this system. I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.